I want to tell you right now that this week is a, uh, there will be a continuation from this week into next week. Uh, this is a two-part deal here. So uh, do everything you can to, to come back next week. Um, they are separate, but they do go together. Uh, where we end today, we'll pick up next week. So uh, just, just want you to know that. What we're looking at today is you can title it a lot of different things. Um, we're talking about some unconditional love. We're talking about desires. We're talking about dreams, wishes, and hopes that we come into marriage with. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about for the next, for this week and, and then kind of leading up into next week. Uh, but to review, week one, we looked at uh, setting priorities. And we talked about God being our number one priority above all else. Uh, our relationship with Him takes precedence over everything. And that if we don't have that relationship with Him, that we can't even understand the, the marriage concept of what God created anyway. So, so without that, we can't even be here. We can't even talk about what we're looking at. There's nothing that I can tell you that will help you in your marriage if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Absolutely nothing. So it starts there. And after that, our number two priority on this wor- in this world, on this earth, is our spouse. And that's behind nothing else. Not, not behind our kids, not behind our job, not behind our ministry, not behind our serving, not behind our parents, not, not behind anything else. <coughs> our spouse is our number two priority, behind, only behind God. All right, so that was week number one. And then week number two, we looked at... Uh, laying a foundation and we we looked at transparency and being transparent in a marriage and what God intended it to be when he created Adam and Eve and how there was nothing between them and we talked about divine marriages and how when God is in our marriages that's what makes it divine not anything that we do not anything that we are but it's him and then last week we talked about the fall and uh, we talked about snares avoiding snares I pointed out two things that Satan uses as tools. Anybody remember what they are? For a woman, it was what? Deception. For a man, it was what? Passivity. Those are That's the tools. In some way, shape, form, Satan uses those. And he uses those on all of us. It's in, passivity is not a personality. It's, it's a fault that is in man, period. Uh, there is nothing that, that, that says the loud, boisterous man is not passive, and there's nothing that says that the man that's meek and quiet is passive. It's not a personality. And we get that so messed up in our culture today. But passivity is where a man sits by and lets decisions be made that destroy his family. And that's, uh, that's what happened with Adam and Eve. It's what happens in our marriages today. We, uh, we let Satan take control of our marriages without protecting and providing, not just financially protecting and providing emotionally and in every way. We're going to get deeper into a lot of that stuff, uh, especially with the roles and, and uh, with things like that. Last, <laughs> last week was a 10,000-foot view. It was not a, uh, not, that, there was no way to take what we looked at last week and drill it down to exactly where we are today. Um, It was definitely an overview, and I hope that you were able to talk about that and to see where in your marriage am I being passive as a man? Where in my marriage is Satan trying to show me that there's something better out there for me if I'm a woman? And, and, And I want you to see those things and understand that those are tools that Satan uses. And, uh, it's, it's very, very much obvious when we look in the Bible and we see his tools that he uses. So, this week, let's talk about desires. I've got a box up here. And uh, every one of us would come into marriage with desires. And we have this box right here. You know, we had, we've had marriages here lately, a couple of marriages. And any time that we were married, when you walk down the aisle... Of course, you had your flowers and you had your other things as you walked down the aisle. But you had this box, too. You had this box with your desires, with your hopes, your wishes, your dreams of what you thought marriage would be like. And this is what it's going to be. 
And this is how it's going to look. And these are the things that we're going to have. And these are the things that we're going to do. And we have a lot of things in this box of desires. And before I even get started here, I want us to understand that these desires are legitimate. <clears throat> these desires are justified. These desires are things that are good. Okay? So we're not downing these desires. They're great things. And in our time that we're engaged before we're married, we talk about these desires. We talk about the things that we want. We talk about the way that we want our marriage to look. We talk about the, the house that we want to live in. We talk about the things that we want to do. And, and so here we are, and we have these desires, and let's look at some of these desires. We desire a nice big house, and when you live in a house with girls, this is the kind of stuff you get project lessons. So if you desire a big pink house with dogs and bunnies and cats on the front of it, here you are. But anyway, no, seriously, we all have desires. We desire these things. We see the house that we want. Another thing that we talk about that we wish kids will have kids in the first year of marriage. We'll have kids in the tenth year of marriage. We're not having any kids at all. You know, we have those discussions, the desires, what we're looking at. Another thing is, is uh, we have this desire. Of, man, I bet she can cook just like my mom. You know. <laughs> We have these wishes, these hopes, these desires <laughs> of good cooking, things like that. Those are our wishes. Maybe your wishes and desires is that she doesn't cook at all. I don't know. Maybe your wishes and desires is that he does all the cooking. But we have our wishes and we have our hopes. Another thing we have is, is who's going to do the chores around the house? The different things like that. We have our, our wishes and, and desires of how that will be split up, who will be in charge of that, who will take ownership in that area. And we talk about these things. They're not not just something that we just do. Another thing is what car we'll drive. <laughs> I have hopes and desires <laughs> that one day we will be driving around in this. We have wishes, we have hopes, we have desires. Another thing we have desires is, is time. And this is a big one. We have wishes and hopes and desires of how we'll spend our time. We have hopes of how we'll schedule things, where we'll spend holidays, how we'll spend time with our friends. We'll merge our friends. We'll, you'll spend time with your friends, I'll spend time with my friends. Things like that. We, we schedule everything out. We, we have hopes of how that'll look. And we see how that'll look as we talk about it. Another thing, we have hopes and desires. Men, of what our wives will not wear to bed. <laughs> we have those. And of course, as you might feel, well, it's comfortable, you know, you love me for who I am, that's good. We have those desires. Another desire that we have is financial. We'll make this much money, we'll have this. These are things that we'll have, these are things that we'll do. We have all these hopes, have all these desires, have all these wishes. And like I said, they're not a bad thing. Or not. It's what we look at. It's what we think about. It's what we talk about. We're engaged. We, we share these with each other. They're healthy. We want things, right? We set goals in life. And it's really, really important. But see, here's the problem. If I walk down this aisle and I got this box of desires. And my wife walks down this aisle and she's got these boxes of desires. And we both have these boxes of desires. And the desires are based around me. What I feel, what I want, what I hope for, what I dream for, what I desire. And those, that's the box that I'm bringing in. Of course it is. I'm not, who else am I supposed to be hoping for, desiring for, wishing for? You know, this is, it's about me, right? And that's the box that I walk in. And then my wife walks in with the same box. 
her box, not the same box as mine. So now we're leaving with two boxes and their desires, and that's good. But the problem is, at some point in time, whether it be as soon as we turn around and walk down the aisle, or later on in our marriage, those desires change. <clears throat> Not the things that is there, but they move. They move to a different box. They move to a box called expectations. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how in our marriages, all these things, they move from the desire box. You know, we desire this house. It's what we wanted. Now I expect it. You know, I desired this. Now I expect it. Desired this. Expect it. And we take all these things, and we move them over from a box of desire to a box of expectation. And this is where we have problems. This is where things get a little messed up in our marriages. See, because here's the thing. I can desire something. And uh, if it goes that way, then I'm really, really happy. But if I expect something and it goes that way, it's supposed to. Right? So I want to look at this. Every marriage is like this. Every marriage has this. You're sitting here this morning and you've got this. You went into it with a box of desires. Everybody good with that? Anybody got any problem with that? All went into it with a box of desires. At some point in time, that box turns into expectations. For every one of us, at some point in time, that box turns into expectations. So, here's what's going to happen when that happens. We've got a few options. Not very many. The first one. We grab our box, and we leave. Why does that happen? We grab our box and we leave because she will never live up to what I expect her to be. He is not the husband that I expect him to be. He will never get there. Or on the flip side, I take my box and leave because I'll never meet up to her expectation. You know what I mean? We have this, right? We pick up our box and we leave. Because we cannot meet the expectations that's out there in front of us. I'm tired of fighting, I'm tired of dealing with it. And I'll leave. But this morning I want to spend time talking about three other things that we could actually do. Marriages that we can have with boxes of expectations. And uh, I want to look at those and see what they look like. But before I do, let's pray and just ask God to show us exactly what we need. Dear Lord, I. We come to you this morning as a group, God, and we just need you to show us what you have for us. God, there's nothing in me that can that can share this, God. It's all you. It's all your desires, your, your plan, and your will for our lives, God. And we just ask you to show us exactly what we need and exactly what we have to have from you. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to look at one verse before we start. Genesis chapter 2, same place we've been, and this is just where we're going to start. We're going to end somewhere else. But Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. We're going to get into that a little bit more in a minute. But I want you to be thinking about that verse, and I want you to hold that verse in your mind this morning. So here's what we do. Our first option is we leave. We take our box and we leave. Our second option is that we live a conformed marriage, and this is going to sound real familiar to some of you as we look at this. The conformed marriage that we're living in today and that we see that we have the option of doing is where one party is strong and one party is weak. One party has a stronger personality, more of a drive, and the other one has a weaker personality. And what happens in the conformed marriage is we take these expectations, and the stronger partner says, this is the way things will be. This is what I expect. This is the way I want things to be. This is the way that I want things to happen. And in those first few years of marriage, 
you fight about it. Constantly, you're fighting about it. You're banging heads and you're saying, no, this is the way it should be. No, this is the way it should be. No, this is the way it should be. But any time that we've got that going on and there's a stronger party and a weaker party, eventually the stronger one will win. You understand what I'm saying? Eventually the weaker one will be conquered. And they will say, if that's what we got to do, that's what we got to do. Here, let's do it your way. Let's do it your way. Let's do it your way. This is the way that you expect things to go. This is the husband I'm supposed to be. This is the wife that I'm supposed to be. This is the way that I'm supposed to do it because your mama did it that way. Then let's do it that way. And this happens a lot. And we have these marriages everywhere where one party is conquering the other one. And it's not always man conquering female or woman. And it's not always woman conquering man. It's kind of mixed both ways. It's all about personalities. And whoever has the stronger one will conquer. And so when we look at this, we this, this is what we wind up with. And, and the problem with this is, this is still all about me, okay? This is all about me. I want things done this way because this is the way I expect it. That's the stronger one. The weaker one says, it's not really the way I want things, but I want things to be, I, I want to make you happy. So we're going to do it this way. It's still about me. Might be about love. Might be about uh, a, a duty or whatever. We're married. This is how it's going to be. This is what i got to do. But the marriage is still based on me. And so when we look at this, it, this can last for a while. This does last for a while. There are a lot of marriages that are going on right now that are lived just like this. The problem is at some point this starts to break down. And when we look at the divorce rate of, of, of in the late 30s and early 40s of the people that are being divorced after being married for years and years and years and years and years, the biggest problem is they just can't take it anymore. Physically, emotionally, they're just beat up. Now that stronger party felt like, man, things are great. Things are going awesome. Things are the way that they should be. I'm getting everything out. This, is, this was what I envisioned. This is what I expected. And so everything's good. The problem is that what you've done as a stronger party is you've asked somebody else to be you. And see, here's the thing. I don't have any problem being me. I have no issues with me being me. But if I ever try to be Nikki, I'm going to struggle. I can't do the things... I can't do the things the way she does them. We we think differently. We have two different personalities. We're not the same person. And so when I try to be her, what it leads to is stress, anxiety, emotional defeat. And and, and I get to a point where it's just over and I can't take it anymore. I can't take it. And so then the marriage ends. And this is that marriage that lasts for several years. But it's just miserable. Anybody know those? Do we see those? We see them all around us. And that's what happens in in that kind of marriage. The next kind of marriage that I want to talk about, well, before I go to that, let me just give you an example. I mean, when we think about this and we think about what we expect out of each other, the... There's absolutely nothing in our marriage the way that God intended. You know, because it, it, it's it's not a it's not a marriage. It's not a love. It's not me giving and you giving because we love God and because we want to submit to Him. And that's what we're going to get to further. The next kind of marriage that I want us to look at this morning is a compromise marriage. Very, very, very common. And when we, we when you talk to people that's mar- been married for a long time, a lot of them give this answer, right? How have you how have you made it thirty years? Compromise. Got to give a little. Got to give a little. I give a little here, she gives a little there. We compromise. That sounds good. And there's a lot of people that stay married forever, living this compromised marriage. So here's the thing. There's still a problem here. There's a problem with the compromised marriage. The problem with the compromised marriage is it's still all about me. 
See, if I'm living in a compromised marriage, and I'm doing my part and you're doing your part, and we're compromising here and compromising there, and we're doing the things that, that I want to do so you can do the things you want to do, there's always a back and forth. You know, if I ever stop, you'll stop. If you ever stop, I'll stop. Because it's about me getting what I want. And if I get what I want, then I just got to give a little more here or a little more here so that I can get the things that I want. That's what a compromised marriage looks look, looks like. And that's what we've done when we put these expectations in. You know what? Yeah, we'll, we'll go your route on the house. We're going to go my route over here. You know what I mean? Everybody feel me? I'm just sitting there this morning with just like blank stares on your face. Are we... <laughs> Y'all are getting me, right? Am I, am I on track here? All right. Do what? Okay. All right. But the problem, like I said, with this compromised marriage is that it is about me. Another thing about the compromised marriage, the compromised marriage is not a covenant. When we, when we talk about marriage, we're talking about a covenant. When we talk about marriage, we're talking about unconditional love between a man and a woman. A covenant, the way that God made a covenant with us. When we look at Ephesians uh, chapter 6, when we look at verse 24, I think it is, where it says, or, or 25, that says, a man should love his wife as Christ loved the church. That's unconditional love. That's the covenant that Jesus, or that God made between man and woman. And that's what is expected. You can't have a covenant in a compromised marriage because you leave no room for unconditional love. There's no way that you can give it. There's no way that you can receive it. You know, I do things that you love because you did things that I love. I do things that you desire and that you expect because you do things that I desire and I expect. And it's not just impossible to receive that unconditional love. It's impossible to give that unconditional love. We can't do it. Because we're not in a covenant. We're in a contract. And that's a powerful word that I want to talk about in just a second. And we're in a contract. And I want you to think about every contract that you know of. And I want you to tell me something. Do any of them come with love, intimacy, trust, romance? No. They don't. So when we live this compromised marriage and we take away the covenant that God's given us and we turn it into a contract, the first three things to go is intimacy, trust, and romance. They're gone. They're gone. Because how in the world can we be in a, in a, in a situation where we're intimate, where we have romance in our marriage uh, when there's no unconditional love? When there's nothing there. I'm doing what you're doing, what you tell me that you want, and you're doing what... You tell me how. Let me give you an example. Think about this as, as desires and as, as, as expectations and and, uh, and living in that compromised marriage. There's things that I desire. Nikki knows that some of the things that, that I desire. Uh, one of the things that I love is for her to get up in the mornings when I get up. I love that. She gets up and she makes some eggs and I take a shower and get ready and then after that, we sit down together and we talk and we eat breakfast together and we enjoy the first part. It makes my day. I love it. I mean, I really do. I really, really, really desire that. I love that. And I have the whole time we've been married. And she knows that. But see, here's the thing. I can desire that or I can expect it. I can move it over here and I can expect that. And when I do that, when I move that desire, that legitimate desire from here to here, it loses all intimacy. It loses all bit of romance. It loses all bit of trust. Example, think about this. If I desire her to get up with me in the mornings, when she does, how does it make me feel? Makes me feel great. <clears throat> Makes my day start off better. If I desire that, then it makes me feel awesome. If I expect that, and she gets up with me in the morning, 
Everything goes just like I had once desired, but now I'm expecting it. How does that make me feel? Does it make me feel loved? Yeah. It's what she's supposed to do. She's my wife. That's what she's supposed to do. Come on. How do I feel when she doesn't? Mad. This is what you were supposed to do. You didn't do it. This is what I expect. So then when I know something that she expects, what do I do? I don't do it. She didn't do what I expect. I'm not doing what she expects. And then we're living in this contract where it's, I'll do it if you do it, and you'll do it if I do it. We turn our lives into bargaining chips. Intimacy's gone. Trust is gone. Romance is gone. Flip that and think about this. Has your mortgage company ever sent you a letter thanking you for paying your bill? <laughs> Never. They don't do it. You know, you don't go home and you pull out that envelope from the mortgage company and says, just want to thank you. Man, like 36 payments in a row on time. It's awesome. Thank you. We appreciate that. Here's a gift card. Go out and have something good with your wife. <laughs> when do you get that letter? Miss it. Mess up. Forget to pay it. Don't hold up your end of the deal. That's when you get the letter. You can feel that in your marriage, can't you? You feel that. The only time that you get that personalized message is when you mess up. We don't meet expectations. We don't do the things that the other one expects us to do. And here's the thing. I'll go back to this. Legitimate desires. Legitimate desires. Everything that we're talking about. I, I'm not talking about anything that's way out there that we shouldn't even want. Okay? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about things that we talked about before we got married. These are things I want. These are things that I desire. And the other party says, yes, I do too. It's awesome. I desire that we, you know, that I start my own business and we make this money, we buy this house. That's awesome. And she's like, yeah, that's great. I desire that too. We get married and she's like, all right, where's it at? <laughs> <laughs> when are we getting it? Are we there? It's what we do. We move it here. And you can live your, I, I promise you guys, you can be married for 50 years like this. You can. Because it takes an extreme amount of commitment. But here's the problem. What you're committed to is not a person. What you're committed to is a marriage. What you're committed to is a contract. I can pay on a house for 30 years and then it's mine. It's been committed to a contract to hold up my end of the deal. And you can do that. And you can go through your whole life and people can ask you, How'd you do it? How'd you stay together 40 years? How'd you stay together 50 years? How'd you stay together and have all these grandkids and all this stuff? How'd you do it? Compromise. It's not what I want. It's not what God intended. 
Genesis 2.24 says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife. Not unto his marriage. We're not making a contract. We're not making a deal that we're going to stay in this thing until we're gone. That's not what we're doing. We're making a commitment to one another. And when we make a commitment to one another, it's no longer about me. My desires, my wishes, my hopes, yes, they're still there. But I don't expect somebody else to fill those for me. What do I do with them? What's the, what's the last thing? What, what can we do? If we don't live that conform, if we don't just leave, we just have to stay. And we don't live that conformed marriage and we don't live that compromised marriage, then what do we do? What do we do? Flip over to Ephesians chapter 5 with me. This is where we're going to be next week. And this is where we're going to pick up at. This is what we do. This is what marriage should look like. This is what God intended when he put us together. When he, called, when he gave us the desire to be with one another. Without desire, or without moving our desires to our expectations. This is what he expected. And I want you to look at verse number 21. This is so important that we get this in our marriages today. And we're going we're going strong into this next week. But I want to read this. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. See, when I am married and when I make this covenant with my wife, it's not based on my feelings. It's not based on my wishes, my desires, or my expectations. God has given me her. And because I love him, I love her. Because of what he's done for me, I want to make her happy. I don't want to expect things from her. I want us to have desires together, and I want us to go for things, and I want us to please each other when we meet those desires, but I don't want to expect something and have this contract over here. I want to have a covenant. And when we do this in, chapter, in verse number 21 in chapter 5 of Ephesians, and when we submit ourselves unto each other because of the fear of God, because we love Him, because we worship Him, then it becomes a covenant. Then we remove the contract. When we look at the word fear of God, what it's talking about is the worship. We worship Him. And the way that we worship God is we submit ourselves one to another. I'll end with this. So I want you to understand, and I know I've said it several times, I, I want you to get it. You can live your life like this. You can. You can have a marriage that's like this. And you can sit here and you can tell me, and you can justify over and over and over and over to me why you expect this. You can tell me that you had discussion after discussion before you got married and that this is what you were going to expect. You know, Nikki and I discussed before we got married. We've been married for th well, 13 years. <laughs> 13 years we've been married. And uh, we talked about when we were engaged that I wanted, we both wanted her to stay at home with the kids. When we had kids. That's what we both wanted. We desired that. Both did. It's in both of our boxes. Let me ask you something. If that desire moved to an expectation, what happens to that? We desire that. She's appreciative that she can stay home with the kids. When 
and I desire that. I'm appreciative that she's willing to stay home with the kids. I love her because she does that. She loves me because I can provide that. You understand what I'm saying? When that moves to an expectation, and she expects me to be able to do that, that she don't give a flip how much money I make. She don't give a flip how well I provide, just as long as it's well enough that she can do what she expected to do. And if I expect that, then I don't care if she wants to stay home with them or not. We talked about it. Do it. It's your job. It's what you're supposed to do. That's the way we live our lives. She does stay home. She has for 11 years that we've had kids. We've been through horrendous financial times in those 11 years. When we started our business, we were great for a couple of years, and it tanked. I don't mean it tanked like it wasn't real good. I mean like... <coughs> There was really no reason for me to go to work, but I did anyway. There was no business, but we'll show up and look at each other. And what got us through those times, and she was still able to stay home, is because that's what we desired, both of us. We gave it to God. We submitted it to Him. And he showed us that no matter what, you can do this. But if I had, if she had expected that that's what she got to do, or that she, that, that was the role that she was going to play, <laughs> and back a few years ago, she wasn't able to, to do it the way that she wanted to because there wasn't any money. If we would have, we'd have been committed to marriage, to a contract, not to each other. So we're not able to make those sacrifices that we make in a covenant when it's a contract. Y'all with me? Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm done for today. We're going to pick up next week in Ephesians chapter 5. Um, we're going to talk about the great submission. Fun topic for us to talk about. It's always one of those in a marriage uh, series that everybody looks forward to. I hope that you got the preface of that today. It starts with verse 21, not verse 22. Uh, got some questions for you today. These are not really discussion questions because I don't know that you want to discuss these. Which one of these three types would describe your marriage? Describe your marriage? I'm talking conformed to marriage, um, compromised marriage, or submitted marriage. Which one of these types would, would describe your marriage? What are some ways God has shown his unconditional love towards you? This is kind of an obvious question. Or an obvious answer to this question, but I want you to really think about some more ways, many ways that God shows his unconditional love toward us. And then the last question is, what are some legitimate desires that you have that you have not shared with your spouse? Here's what I'm talking about. Legitimate desires, okay? These are some things that we want, that we desire in our marriage. You know what? If Nikki didn't know that I didn't, that I wanted her to get up in the mornings with me and, and hang out and have eggs and coffee and, and, and pray and read and just spend time together, if she didn't know I wanted that, would I ever get it? No. 
Especially not if her desire is to sleep. And it is. <laughs> and, and that's the thing. Nikki is not a morning person at all. <laughs> at all, at all, at all. That time that I'm in the shower is the time that she becomes lovable. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> no, that is, that is uh, that, that really is something that it will not happen. But guys, we have to share our desires with each other. Now listen, I think he always had this desire and this hope and this dream to be married to a, uh, a professional baseball player. That ain't gonna happen. <laughs> it's not gonna happen. It's not a legitimate desire. You understand what I'm saying? What do we do with this? Because I'm not saying it's not a desire. It might be. <laughs> <laughs> we give those to God. We have to think about those things that we grew up wanting, you know. Because they're there. Whether or not we, we really want to admit it, they're there. We have those things that are never going to happen that we desire. We've got to give them up. We've got to give those to God. We've got to ask Him to take those away from us, to take those desires away. Okay? But, so please... Do not go home and share that your desire is that you be married to something that there's no way your spouse can be. Don't do that. Share legitimate desires. Okay? Homework this week is to get together and answer those three questions. Together. Because you might think that you have a submitted marriage and your wife might think that you have a conquered marriage. Or a conformed marriage. <laughs> you see that? That can happen, right? Everything's going good on my side. It's great, man. But everything's happening like I want. You might not be in a submitted marriage. You might be in a conquered marriage. And if your spouse feels conquered, you've got to change to that. Right? Very important that we get this stuff straightened out. Of course, I told you homework's the same every week. Get along, get along, get along, get along, get along. And answer these questions. Could not drive home the importance of us getting along and talk, alone and talking about our marriages. Unbelievably important. Okay? If you need help with that, call me. We will find someone to keep your children. Thank you. We will find <laughs> to keep your children. <laughs> wife has taught teenage girls in this church since they were in the fourth grade. She knows a lot of them very, very, very well. She can tell you which ones you can trust and which ones you cannot trust. <laughs> <laughs> Watch your kids. Okay? Alright guys. Love y'all. I hope you don't feel beat up. I hope you're getting something from this. All right, my intention is not to beat anybody up. All right? Dear Lord, we just thank you, God, for this day. We thank you for giving us your word and for showing us, Lord, that, that what you've given us as marriage is a covenant. It's a covenant. It's not a contract. And, Lord, I just ask that you uh, engulf every marriage in here, Lord, that you show us grace, that you show us how to give grace that you show us your unconditional love and you show us how to give it and how to receive it to our spouses. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name.